Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number 15, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on September 7, 2005. This episode of the Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games, makers of Battleground Fantasy Warfare, the miniature war game without miniatures. To learn more about Your Move Games or to take a flash demo of Battleground, please visit www.yourmovegames.com. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. Well, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Dice Tower. We're sure glad to have you on board, and I hope that if you haven't entered our contest for Pizza Box Football, Pizza Box Baseball, and Elfin Ball, that you enter that. Go back and listen to episode 117 or listen to our upcoming episode 118 to find out how to enter those. Well, anyway, here we are with another episode in the past. Now, if you listen to this episode... You'll hear me talking a little bit about the website. Back then, the website was just some HTML that I put together. I'm, I know a little bit about web programming, but not very much. And it seems like the more each year goes by, the less I know because it just advances so fast. Well, thanks to Steve Chellis, uh, who redesigned my whole website, I'm really happy with what the Dice Tower looks like now. And if you ever get a chance, I recommend you go there. There's all my reviews and such. And... You know, I know that a lot of other sites have different things on them, but it's a good website to check out the archives of the Dice Tower and the Top Ten list, which is, of course, the most popular part of the website. But I just want to say a big thank you to Steve for putting that website together. All right, let's go back and see what Joe and I had to say two years ago. Well, welcome to the Dice Tower. This is Tom Vassell. And I'm the good-looking guy, Joe Stedman. Okay. And <laughs> the Dice Tower you're listening to is a podcast about board games. Uh, we actually talk about all different tabletop games, including collectible card games, role-playing games occasionally, uh, miniature games, but mostly about board games. I speak mostly about uh, Euro games and American games, and Joe likes to talk about... War games, right? I like to talk about the real games, not the, yeah, the conflict games, conflict simulation. Well, it's been an interesting week. Uh, lots going on in the world. Yeah, our hearts really go out to what's going on in New Orleans right now. Uh, we're on your side of the world, so we're kind of removed. I can't imagine what it must be like to be in the States right now. We just hear about it just through the news, and I mean, there's no, you know, just once in a while, I guess you would say, on the news. So, there's a lot check of them blogs. Out. There's a lot of blogs lately. It's good, though. I think it's great for the hobby. Didn't you do a blog about that yourself? A blog about blogs? Did yeah, that, I did do a blog about blogs. That's a good blog, because I, I found other blogs about blogs. <laughs> How many times can I say blogs? Well, I'm wondering if what we need for blogs is like a is a, is one web page that points you to the best articles and blogs. But huh. I'm still mulling that over whether I want well, to jump into that or not. With blogs, you're allowed to quote each other's blogs without fear of reprisal. It's kind of like accepted, right? Oh, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, for those of you who don't know, Tom, I'm Tom Vassell, and this is Joe Stedman, and, and what we are is we're missionaries in Korea who happen to like board games a lot, and a lot, so yeah. we uh, put out this podcast weekly, and so we, we invite you to, to listen up to it. Yep. Uh, and so we want to keep this thing real content-filled, talk about board games, and to start that off, we have re- two reviews of two, uh, well, two games... One's really old, and one's really new. And one's brand new. First uh, one's from Joe. And I'm doing the old one, go figure. Uh, often I talk about my favorite game, and uh, I realized, I guess today, or the other day, when I was thinking about what game to review, a lot of people may have not heard of it or ever, you know, didn't know the details of it. And so I'm just going to do a quick review of a classic, and that's the game Diplomacy. Now, uh, when I first heard about Diplomacy was when I first got into the hobby. I heard people talking about it like the, the holy grail of games, and I, I never really, you know, considered getting it or anything. Well, I finally, when Tom and I, what, what four years ago, Tom, or so? Uh, no, it was like three years three ago. Three years ago. We, we made some uh, online purchases, and one of the first games I bought was Diplomacy. And it, sit, it sat on the shelf at my house for probably a two or three months before I even opened it and got the rules out. And I read the rules, and I was kind of like, man, that's it? Because the rules are very, very simple. Diplomacy is a game that's a seven-player game uh, put out mostly by Avalon Hill, but there's been a lot of games companies that have produced it over the years. But Avalon Hill still is currently making this game, or I'm not sure. It might just went out of production. I'm not sure. But you can get it real cheap on eBay. You can get it offline. Yeah, it's not a hard game to find. No, it's it's everywhere. You can get the old version. It's been in production since uh, 1959, so it's a pretty popular game. But it's a seven-player game. It's two to seven. I can't imagine playing two people. I mean, it'd be kind of silly. But... Uh, Five, it works well with five to seven. I probably wouldn't play it. I really wouldn't want to play it unless I could get seven people together. And each person takes on the role of one of seven countries. Uh, it's basically a, 
very loosely themed uh, after the beginnings of World War One with the, all the different alliances and the entangling alliances, as they call them. And uh, each of you takes a role of the country, and you only have two types of units. You have ships, and you have men or infantry. And so these armies and these ships, uh, you write orders for them every turn, uh, secretly on paper, and you turn them in, and then they're all read out loud together, and uh, it's and then you educate those orders. And so there's only four things that you can do on your turn. You can you can move from one spot to another spot. You can hold. You can support. Now, this is the, the hard part to understand, I guess. It was hardest for me to grasp. You can support another unit. And the last thing that you can do is you can convoy a unit, which basically means move one army uh, across the sea zone to another land spot by using a ship. The support is the tricky part. A support is where the game is basic mapped. One versus one, if, I, if you're in one zone and I wanted to move my man into the same zone, it's one versus one, and it, it's called a bounce. Therefore, nothing happens, and I go back to where I started, and you stay where you're at. But if I can get someone to support me, one of my other units, then it's two versus one, and I'll push you out, and you'll have to retreat. Well, the beauty of the game and the, the whole point of the game is diplomacy, meaning that you have to talk to the other players and make deals. And uh, so I'll say to Tom, hey, Tom, will you help me push... Bob out of this this area here, and, and so, I'll say sure. <laughs> and so you know Tom will Tom will write his orders, and I might write my orders, and when we, we reveal the order, orders, it'll say you know Joe moves from here to here, and Tom supports that move, and then we would therefore push the bad guy or the other person out of that zone. But the whole point of one of the other, one of the funniest things about diplomacy, or the thing that most people hate about diplomacy, I should say, is that it's called the stab, and the stab is where you tell someone one thing and you do something else. It's highly encouraged in this game. Cheating is encouraged. Lying is encouraged. Every possible trickery that you could think of is encouraged, and that's to, to me it's just the fun part of the game. It's a classic. It's huge uh, support for it on the internet. There's a lot of web pages you can go to. Play in it by email is very very popular. I'm currently in two games right now. Um, there's just a lot that can be said about this game and uh, it's the only game I know that when I play it, other than maybe a real intense war game when it's a real pivotal decision to be made, uh, it's the only game I know that when I play it face to face I have a, a, a knot in my stomach almost the whole game because I'm nervous or I'm, I'm contemplating what other people, if they're going to lie to me if they're telling the truth or not, it's just a great game if you can get seven people together uh, preferably people who won't hate each other after the game. Uh, it's, so it's, you should try it. At least one time in your life, you should try it. Yeah, you should probably try it. For me, it wasn't anything that I really liked, but, I mean, because I don't like that knot in my stomach that I get. <laughs> but, like Joe said, even though it is out of print, and I, I don't even recommend that you go out and buy it, I recommend that if you're interested in it, to go try it, playing it by email. It's yeah. a really good way to learn the game for free, and you'll find your six opponents. Well, at the same time, though, I mean, if you're going to play it by email, I do think that you should... I'm one of those old-fashioned people who think that if you're going to play a game on the Internet, then you should at first own a copy of it physically. So I don't think it's a bad thing if, if it's out of print. Well, out of print, I guess. Would be, yeah, I'm not really sure. I should just research that real quick and find out if Avalon Hill is still making it. I know they are making it last year, so I'm not sure. I don't know if it's in their current line, but, well, if someone knows about that, that'd be interesting. Okay, my game is not quite as well-known as Joe's. In fact, it's it's quite new. It's made by Wingnut Games, designed by Tom Jolly, and it's called Camelot, or I guess they'll call it Tom Jolly's Camelot to distinguish it from the slew of other Camelot games that are out there. <laughs> Too many. Uh, Shadows over Camelot, Camelot Legends. This one's just called Camelot. And basically the theme of this game is I have a family that has a bunch of Arthurs, and Joe has a family that has a bunch of Arthurs, and our other friend Bob has a family. And basically How original, eh? everyone's trying to get their Arthur to be the one to pull the sword from the stone. And that's a pretty funny theme. But the game is really interesting because the game uses this lightning system which uh, Wingnut Games has patented. And I don't know whether you should patent a game mechanic or not. That's a discussion <laughs> for another time. But th- what the mechanic is is basically there's two turn pieces. Let's say Joe starts with one and I start with one. I take my turn, and as soon as I'm done, I give my turn person to the person on my left who doesn't have a turn piece. So if Joe's my left and he's taking a long time to do his turn, and I'm done with my turn. I will skip Joe and hand my turn piece to the person after yeah, him. That was pretty cool. I, I was wondering if I could, if it wasn't patented, I'd probably steal that for some of my multiplayer war games. It's actually a really interesting <laughs> idea. But what happens is, is it makes the game really chaotic. See, what you're doing is you're trying to get your Arthurs in the middle of this game board, grab a sword, and come back. But meanwhile, you can declare attacks on other people if your strength of your characters are stronger than theirs. So you're you're constantly pausing the game and killing people, and then they die, and they bring more people on the board. And it is probably the most chaotic game I've ever played, except for Pit. Oh, 
Can I chime in here? Yes, go ahead. I, I really, really didn't like this game. I, I will never play it again, and I halfway through the game I wanted to quit. It's just it's it's like a war game mixed with chaos and war gamers like their rules and they like their CRTs and they like to be able to know that you know, I don't like the chaos factor and this game, it doesn't work well with me. I, just, I really, really liked it. <laughs> this is the game that we really get We are total opposites because, on this game. Because it, it, it just, it was so chaotic, it was just funny. Uh, if I you think find there was chaos people, funny, then There was people it. dying. I don't normally like that much chaos, but in this situation, it reminded me of, a, of the game we played as a kid. I, I forget what it was called, but where someone had a football and then everyone tackled them and they threw the it, football up in the air. It reminded me and of... And then uh, everyone tackled that person. It was, it was just funny. It reminded me a little bit of Fight ball, but like four player fight ball. <laughs> if you know fight, fight ball and uh, brawl. The game isn't long, and there's problems with the, the, the game goes so fast that if people are breaking the rules, yeah. you, you won't know because you want you're it, so like, busy like, watching your own pieces. Yeah. That one girl that was playing with us, she was like totally cheating, and no one realized it because the game is just so chaotic, and she wasn't trying to cheat. She was just yeah, she wasn't intentionally cheating. But she told totally was defying the rules. But we explained that, and then we played. I think if everyone knew the rules really well, It'd be interesting, but another feature of the game is is that sometimes the guy in your right will attack your guys, and you'll get so caught up in fighting him that you'll forget both forget about happened getting the me. sword. Yeah, happened to me. <laughs> You're just killing their characters; they kill yours. You kill them. Blood feud. <laughs> so, uh, I, I I I can't tell you if you're gonna like it or not. I really liked it. Another guy who we played with really liked it. Joe didn't like it. And another, another guy we played didn't like it. So. Uh, well, another person didn't like it. And then the th- and then the fifth person thought it was funny and enjoyed it, but they that didn't feel the, the need the to play it for a long time. That was the lady who was playing with us, right? Uh, no, it was, it was Flip Flop. She didn't like it. He did. Oh, okay. But it's a really fun game, uh, but I, it's probably a definite try-before-you-buy game because you may like this ca- sort of chaos in your games, and you may not. So it's up to you. Run so that's, away. Run that's away. Uh, Camelot <laughs> by uh, Wingnut Games, designed by Tom Jolly. And Joe's game was Diplomacy, and so that game's been out forever. Yeah, no. Older than we, me and Joe are. Uh, last week we finished up our contest for the um, Z-Man games, and we gave the results of the contest in the top ten games. Mm-hmm. Joe asked people to send in their top ten personal lists, not what they thought everyone else would pick, but what they actually thought was right. The best. This is what matters, not the, the contest. Well, first of all, before we start, I, I, when I compiled these points. I have to say, I don't think too many war gamers sent their list because <laughs> only two war games made the top 25. That's fine. Um, and I just assume that they just didn't send their list in. Or maybe that there wasn't a whole lot of good war games released last year. No, there's plenty of good war games. It's just they didn't want to stand up against the flood of Euro gamers. Yeah, but I, I, I think, well, I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll I, see think, I think anyone would admit that there's more Euro gamers than there are war gamers. I mean, maybe. But here's, here's how I calculated the points for it. I, I took the, the order of the list that you sent. And for the number one game that you sent, I gave it 15, 15 points, then 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, etc. That way, the lowest game was worth five points, and the and, and six points, and the highest game is worth 15. I, I I started doing it 10 to one, but that made the top your your first pick 10 times as valuable as your bottom pick, and I didn't think that was right because they are your top 10 games. So. I added all those in, and I'm sure this is not the scientific formula. Who cares? I'm a math teacher, so I'm just going to say it's right. <laughs> and the winner, by how do you want me to do this? Read from bottom to top? Yeah, top go, to ten, to, go, go top to top. Yeah, bottom to top. Okay, number 25 was Boomtown with 36 points. And I, I think Boomtown was a pretty good game. Have you played it yet? I don't know. I don't think you have. Seven Ages and Sword of Rome tied for 37. Woohoo, two war games. Again, those probably didn't get it too high because both those games... I don't know if Sword of Rome is a real involved game, is it? It's a four-player card-driven game. It's a great, great game. Well, Seven Ages is a really involved civilization game, and it's not a game that everyone's going to play. Yeah, Sword of Rome, is, it's got intimidating rule book a little bit. The next one I was th- thought was interesting was Niagara, which happened to be the Spiel des Jahres winner, and that, that didn't get that many points. I guess huh. it's not that, that popular. I haven't played it yet. Um, after that was Cluzzle, and that tied with ASL... Starter kit. <laughs> that's, an, <laughs> that's an interesting combo oh, of my games. Goodness. Cluzzle, the clay molding game. Cluzzle is actually on my wand Advanced list. Advanced so. later. My wife liked uh, Barbarossa a lot, so I think I'm going to pick up Cluzzle. It'd be cheaper than trying to find Barbarossa. Once you buy the second edition of Cluzzle, look inside for the Tom Vassal card. It's really in there, too. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> and there's a. You got me clay that looks like you? No, they asked me for different things. Like, put Spider Man, he's my favorite superhero. And I put Taco, which is my favorite food. Oh, by the way, everyone. Today is September 7th as we record this, but tomorrow, September 8th, is my birthday. Yeah, Isn't that yeah, wonderful? Yeah. Woohoo! 
Woo. What are you, like 13? 29. <laughs> 29. 29. All right. After uh, Advanced Squad Leader was Wings of War, the newest expansion. Uh, the back, Burning back drag- Driver. What's Dragons. Oh, oh, well, watch your back. Watch, watch your back. back. Yeah. Then Frederick. I don't know anything about this game. Do you? I heard oh. a lot about it. Uh, Frederick's a, a pseudo war game. Is it's it one of those? Area control, kind of. Ah. Uh, it's, I've heard good things about it. I saw it played at Origins, but I'm, the, I'm a World War II nut, so I only had four days to be there, so I was going to focus on the games I liked. I didn't play that many new games there. Sorry. Then there was a, the next game after that with 55 points was Zeptor. Um, Zeptor? What is well, that? Well, it actually has a longer name. It's some German game. It's like is a real, it Zug Zug? No. No, it, it's a real in-depth, deeper German war game. I mean, not German war game, but German Euro game that just hasn't... Is there a German war games? It hasn't come to America yet. Okay. Then the two-player game... With 90 points is Jambo. I just got it. I have not played it. I plan to play it this week. Then we finally break 100 points. With 109 points was Carcassonne the City. Mm. Beating that out with 116 points was Hansa, which did not even come close to making it on a list of games that people thought other people would pick. But hmm. when they picked the games themselves, they picked it. I like Hansa. It's a mental exercise, but it's kind of boring. Yeah. Then beating Hansa by one measly point was War of the Ring. Yeah. 117. A game I like finally. Mm, there's a lot of discussion about that game, and I, I suspect that there will be for the next ten years. It's a good. It's got lasting power because look at the Tolkien novels got lasting power. The game will last too, right? Right. <laughs> then we jump over 150, and we get 155 points for Struggle Vampires. Ooh, that's a good game. 157 points for Reef Encounter. Ooh. Uh, 159 points for Blue Moon. Now that one surprised me. It's a two-player game. I played it only once. I'll admit, and I just did not see the draws of the game just besides the for artwork you. for the. Adolescent guys. Other than that, <laughs> it just—I don't know. Maybe I'll have to play it again. I heard there's lots of different decks. I'll, I'll try it out. What kind of, is it? A card game? Yes, sir. It's a—it's uh, actually made by Fantasy Flight. It was a two-player. Uh, I believe it's made by Knizia, and there's uh, at least six expansions out so far. Uh, no, it, is, it is by Knizia. It's originally made by Cosmos, and then uh, Fantasy Flight picked it up here in America. Hmm. So. Then Heroescape beat Blue Moon by one point for 160. And then the top ones, 163, Maharaja, 221 points for Ingenious, which I just play with my wife, and she loves it. 232 points for St. Petersburg, which I and Joe disagree with. Uh, but 270 for Goa, uh, 293 for San Juan, which is Joe's second favorite game, <laughs> right after Puerto Rico. Uh, at, least San, at least Puerto Rico's got little, little uh, round slaves that you can use. I mean, settlers. <laughs> All right. Now I have to go delete that off the show. <laughs> then the top three games had no comp- competition except each other. Number three was Memoir 44 with 394 points. Number two was Power Grid with 467 points. And Ticket to Ride Rules Supreme with 543. I like A power. lot of people like Ticket to Ride. Power Grid's my favorite of those three for sure. We're going to be talking about Ticket to Ride in ten years. Of all these games, we'll still be talking about Ticket to Ride, Power Grid, and Memoir in ten years. I, I couldn't tell you if we'll talk War about the any of the rest. Yeah, War of the Ring. Even though it's well, Reef Encounter. It's lower uh, on there. No, well, I think people will mention it, but they won't mention it. It won't be something that every gamer knows. And well, there's been so many games is. in the past decade. I don't know if we'll talk about any games. A decade or five new games to play. Well, don't forget, folks. If you haven't listened to our show last week, go back and listen to it because on our show last week in episode 14, we asked a question, which you have to go back and listen to find out what it is. And if you answer that question, you win two free games. Two free games. Two free. Block games. They're, they're actually war, war games. Let me so rephrase what I just said. If you win, you have a chance. You have a chance. I mean, if, if you guess. Right. <laughs> if you and, guess. Uh, they're very, yeah, the games that are up for grabs are very light uh, war games that I'm sure that uh, Euro gamers would like as well as war gamers. And so I think everyone would want to enter this contest. We've had a decent amount of responses so far, but, I mean, really, you have a really good chance if you even still if you enter. I mean, yeah. a really decent chance. So. Go back and listen to that answer. They're made by Worthington Games. Um, both of them, people have uh, compared to uh, Memoir 44 and other light games that you can play in less than an hour. I'm really interested. I haven't played either one yet, but I know that copies are on the way, so when Joe gets them, I'm going to try them out. I'm looking yeah. really forward to playing them. I'll probably do a review and, of them. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll probably both talk about it on the show once we played it, but this is a chance to win two games. And so... Uh, if you haven't done that, you still have one week to enter this. Next week on the show, we'll do another roll off where we roll and, and, and you'll find out who wins in episode 16 of the Dice Tower. Woo-hoo. We've yeah. made 15 episodes. Wow. So that's our contest. 
we'll, be, we'll try to have another contest for you next week. And so come back and listen to that show then. Maybe we should take like a, a two month break from doing shows. Hmm. <laughs> right. Because we're going we're gonna to hold a convention here in Korea. Yeah, so we're come on the, out to our convention. We're going to have the Joe and Tom Con. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if our wives would come to that. Uh, probably not. All right. Well, it's time for our questions. Do 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 do. All right, we have, uh, I think we only have three questions, no, four questions. Four questions. So yeah. that's good. All right. Well, only, not four, all... only four questions that we're answering on the air. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Joe's answering a lot of questions in his blog, and, yeah. I, and I keep saying I'm going to put a question section up on the website, but because of the coding that takes and all the <laughs> other stuff I'm doing, I'm getting around to it. Hmm. So here is uh, the first question for us from Ken Lee. I'll read this one. I think I can read this one, right? Yeah. Some friends and I have talked about this before, in their opinion, Historical miniature war game sits upon atop the, uh, upon the top of the hierarchy, followed by fantasy miniature games, RPG players, board games, war gamers, and CCG players sitting at the very bottom. So I guess they have like a hierarchy of how they rate game players. He wants to know what we think. Well, on the internet, if you search, you can actually find a, a chart that shows that shows uh, the hierarchy of, of yeah, and the diggers guys are at the very top, right? Well. <laughs> I actually think that there is a hierarchy, but it's different for every group. If of you're course. a war gamer, miniature, you know, what did he say, historical miniatures, they, yeah. they think they're at the top. But of course, but so do Euro gamers and so do war gamers. Right. Except I, do, I don't think CCG players think they're at the top. CCGers <laughs> don't care about anybody else. <laughs> they're, they're at the bottom of every group. They have their own little Look, world. I love CCGs, and I love CCG uh, adult players. <laughs> but... No, I guess they're, they're there's, the there's, there's hierarchies within, yeah, like you said, there's hierarchies within each realm. Like, so what would be, what would be the a real quick hierarchy of like Euro gamers? Of Euro gamers, there's a, a few elite um, snobs. I mean, internet groups <laughs> where they there, there's a lot of designers and people who are members of those. There's some I don't even know about. I, I heard of a few at Origins, and I thought, oh, interesting. And then then there's a the big group Spiel Freaks, which is pretty good, but tends to be snobby. After Spiel Freaks, I would say that the blogs. The blogs are forming a community that's, that they're, they're, they're starting to feel a little elite there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you go to some people's blogs, you can't comment unless you own a blog yourself. Yeah, I noticed that. And I, so, I turned that feature off on mine. You know, so you have to have a the blog. Pro- well, the problem you is... You have to have a blog of your own well, or you're not qualified the to... The problem is if, if you turn that feature off, then you get a lot of spam. So I, I've been cutting... You know, you just got to keep up with your blog and delete the spam, that's all. Well... So what's after the bloggers? After the bloggers is probably Board Game Geek. They're getting... Board Game Geek has a huge community, and, and they're really friendly and all, but they probably think themselves a step above maybe some of the other smaller communities. Probably so. Now, Rec Games Board is at the bottom. There's bottom feeders. There's almost no one there. It's <laughs> well, I guess dead the, board. You saw actual people. I saw about more like the game. Like for, like for war gamers, I think there's like the top of the food chain for war gamers would be the two different categories. There's the monster gamers, and then there's the ASL guys. And so those two guys feel like they're the top of the chain. And then after below that is your, your lighter war games like... Um, Bitter Woods and these, you know, smaller, smaller games like operational level games. And then there's like the card driven games. Go down a little farther. Then you go down a little farther than that. You got like Memoir 44, which is in the very bottom rung. No, no, Risk. Risk. No, Risk is above Memoir 44. And then, <laughs> and then at the very bottom you have like the card game War. That's like there's that's the very bottom. <laughs> So, anyway. here's my answer. I could care less. You come. You like to play games. I'll play with you. I don't care where it's, what. What we are in a hierarchy. Uh, where, 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 would we, where would you fall in the hierarchy, Tom? Oh, I'm a duke. I think I'm a duke right now. A duke? Yeah. I'm not the <laughs> king yet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm just a lonely peasant. All right. Our next question is from Eric Forsyth, who says he hopes it's not too witty to provoke a rant from me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't catch that, but okay. With this running distinction, what signs might show someone is a war gamer or Euro gamer? Oh, man. He says, although you are pretty intense in you, to your own sectors... Have you known anybody who has switched, gasp, from one to the other, or has maintained a balance between the two? Double gasp. Double gasp. A balance. Now, well, Joe's probably come close to keeping a balance because yeah. he does play both. I think I've, I've gone full circle. I mean, I keep on rotating. I, I started off as a pure war gamer, and then I met Tom, and I almost went to pure Euro games for about a year, almost two years. And now I'm going back into my roots, and I'm doing a lot more and more war games. I don't know. But what would be some signs that you're a war gamer or a Euro gamer? Well, I mean... I guess that's the kind of style of game that you like. If you really like, in my opinion, I guess if you, if you really like theme and you really like the, 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 the not, not the, the mechanics of the game, but necessarily, but the theme and the history behind the game, 
and uh, the defeating someone else aspect, uh, the confrontation, I guess that would call you... I, I think confrontation is probably the single biggest thing. Yeah, confrontation. That's, if you don't, if you like confrontation in a game, then you're probably a war gamer. Well, I don't know. You can get pretty confrontation on Euro games. Well, there is Lord of the Rings confrontation. Maybe time is a big factor, too. Time, yeah. If time's not a factor, then you like war games. Well, uh, there's, some, there's some long Euro games. Yeah, but there's nothing. I mean, the but longest Euro games, I think four Euro gamers, hours. Euro gamers are more concerned with social interaction than an actual game. I think I think a lot of it also has to do with complexity. I don't like rule books that need 20 pages or more. I do. And there you have it. Maybe that's it. The rule, rule book, book thing. <laughs> oh. And amongst our friends, I say that most of them have some kind of balance. Um, well, okay. Well, a lot of our games we play here at church. You have no balance. And I would say for the... Yeah, I, oh, I'm not claiming to. And I would say for the majority... Well, I do play light war games. You started off playing war games and you kind of... So you forsake, you've forsaken them and you don't... I have know. forsaken them. But I would say that the majority of the people in our church who play games with us would are not interested in war gamers, especially women. That's not any kind of gender stereotype. It's just the truth. No, but I'm converting over a few. I've converted oh, over women? rich. Play war games? No, not women. Yeah, okay. So that, that's not a stereotype. But it's there just, are women who play war games, so there we, are. we can't stereotype completely. I'm just saying in our church, that's how it is. All right, with people we know first. And then there are a few guys in the church who don't want to play anything other than Euro games. And then there's a few guys who really are interested in war games. And yeah. so we had some guys in the past here who that's all they would play. Remember, like, Mark or mm-hmm. uh, or John, these two two different guys that were soldiers over here? That's every week they wanted to play. The one guy, he only wanted to play Access Now. He's the original version. That's all he ever wanted to play. He asked for it two or three times every week. Yeah, and we didn't want to play any kind of Euro game with him because he would try and turn it into Access and Allies. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. I'm not trading you no beans. We're at war. I'm like, what? How is that even possible in this game? <laughs> so he was definitely a war gamer. I think in your heart you know. Right? In my heart? What? In your heart you know that you're really a war gamer or a yeah, Euro gamer. We'll find out in heaven. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there's very eclectic people that just like everything, too. So This episode of The Dice Tower is sponsored by Your Move Games. Your Move Games has recently launched the Battle for Hill 218, a fast-paced two-player card game with a retail price of just $10, coming soon to your friendly local game store. You can also download a free computer version of Hill 218 at www.yourmovegames.com and play against your PC. All right, the next, the next question is a little long, so we'll, we'll short it down. Basically, it's from Kent Ruber, and he wants to know why people like Blue Moon so much. And we just were talking about that. And then he, he asked, uh, he talked about how Scarab Lords and Minotaur Lords are more compelling. Uh, both those games are, they remind you very much of a C, uh, collectible card game, a CCG, but they're contained in a box. Now, Joe and I have actually played Scarab Lords. Yeah. And I found it interesting, but it seemed, for me, the decisions seemed mechanical. It seemed like where you put your card was really obvious. But I feel that way about a lot of Euro games. Okay, but but this is I wouldn't even consider this a Euro game. It's more like a collectible card game. Yeah. Um, Blue Moon, why is it rated so highly? I, I I don't understand it. I can't answer it either. I'm just gonna have to play it some more and see what the hidden thing is I'm missing because obviously a lot of people like it. And Joe hasn't probably. No, I've, I've I've not played. I've seen Blue Moon at Origins, but I didn't even. But you did play Scarab Lords. You yeah. Remember that now you had yeah, the six I, different areas and we're was, trying to. Control. It was all right. It, yeah, it did feel like a CCG a little bit. The artwork was pretty good. Yeah, it was okay. It just I, I just felt like when I had a card, I knew where I was supposed to play it. Yeah. So, that's about that. I don't know about Blue Moon. I probably need um, to be a Blue Moon before I play it, though. I know that. <laughs> well, that's why they call it Considering neither one of us owns it, maybe if I get a copy. All right, this last question is for Joe from Todd. He says, Joe, I really enjoy your segments on oh, the Dice Tower. thanks. Town. Someone does. And I have a question for you. Currently, I'm playing my first game of World War II European Theater of Operations. Wow. With three other war gamers. I'm finding the beginning turns as the Russian player a little dull, but I'll know that will change soon. I know I'm used to the faster play of ASL. Now, the time you probably laugh when he says the faster play of ASL, don't you? I don't you? know. I'm watching you play ASL every day. I, watch, I, I see Joe playing it. ASL's pretty fast. I, 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 it doesn't seem like it's slow. No. And then he's, so the question is, are there any good monster war games for four players? Right. Well, I guess... The defined monster war game. I mean, just, I guess that's kind a of a game that makes you cry when it comes out of the closet <laughs> in the middle of the night. To me, to me, okay, I'll just say what, what, in my opinion, what a monster war game is, and then I'll tell you what I think. To me, a monster war game is a game that you cannot complete in one day. A monster war game is a game that you set up and you just leave it sit for a few weeks, a month, in someone's basement or something, and then you you, you take turns. And it's usually a huge operational level game, um, but or even even you can go down to the battalion level. Like so I was going to say, the two that I would suggest. Um, 
the first one is Zoc Bay Rhine Part 2. It's perfect for four players because uh, it's the Battle of the Bulge, and it's the way the Bulge works with the Spearheads, it, it basically splits it into two different German players, and then you can divide the Allies or the Americans into two different American players, and they can play completely independent of each other, so it speeds up the game. It's really cool for a monster game because you can have you know, Piper and his group uh, doing his thing against the Americans, and then on the opposite side you have the other German front going against the other Americans, so you basically have two two-player games that is interaction between each other at the same time. Well, how do they interact with each other? Well, artillery assets and different parts. You know, you can cross. There's no, there's no line. There's certain rules that won't let you cross a certain boundary of hexes until a certain point in the game, but they do interact because they have to request to, it, and advice from each other. You look at each other. If, you, if one person is doing better than the other person, you might want to give a little advice because you're on the same team and things like that. And then the other one would be um, Eurofront. And I did a thing in my blog about Eurofront. I posted some stuff about it. So go to my blog and you can read what I have there. But Eurofront's a really good game. It's a block game. And if you've ever seen, you know, if you've ever played East Front, Eurofront is really pretty. I mean, it's it's huge. It's it's Eurofront, West Front, Med Front, Oakland Front. Um, uh, all put into one game under one rule set, and you can play four players. It's I would suggest it, but it's kind of expensive because you got to buy all four games or all five games. But So that's what I would say. Thanks for the question, Todd. Well, thanks for all the questions. Remember, if you have a question for us, email us at thedicetower at gmail.com. You can also find uh, questions from our show and, and different uh, articles and stuff by us, my reviews, etc. Mm-hmm. If you go to our website at thedicetower.com. That starts with T-H-E, thedicetower.com. All right. Speaking of websites... Um, all right. Well, well, so we, we're actually going to, we started, we, we had some questions asked about uh, different websites that we like, so we thought we'd do a new segment. Uh, we, did, we did this segment last week, too, didn't we? No, no, no. This is the first time we've oh, done first it. first time, okay. We're going to do this every month. We'll, or, or at least we once hope. every couple of shows or so. <laughs> uh, we just want to talk about a particular website that we've, uh, we really like that um, uh, for our hobby. And uh, the, so I'll go first. The, I really like a website that's put up by Mark Piskevich. Uh, I think I said how you pronounce his name, Piskevich. Um, lately, I'm in this real ASL kick. And so uh, he's got a great website. It's www.desperationmorale.com. And Desperation Morale is a DM marker. If you're, if, if you're not an ASL player, then don't bother going to this website. And if you are a, an ASL player, you've probably already been to this website. But it's worth going into and checking out, but even if you're not an ASL player, because he's got a, an ASL museum there. And you can go there, and it's got great pictures of dice towers. There's actually a whole segment just on dice towers. i got some cool ideas. I want to try to build some dice towers. Um, all these different pictures of all these nuts playing ASL. And it's a really good website. He's got a ton of player aids and downloadable things that you can download. Uh, he's put a lot of time and effort into the website, and I think it's worth checking out just to, just to see. So that's desperationmorale.com. My website would be thegamesjournal.com, T-H-E-G-A-M-E-S-J-O-U-R-N-A-L.com. Uh, Greg Alignificus puts it out. The Games Journal, once a month, it has really good articles. Um, the best, probably the, some of the best strategy articles you'll read on the Internet about games are there. They only put out like three or four articles each month. It's up every first of the month. But you can go and read their back archives. I mean, really good stuff. Talking about history of games and ethics in gaming. And uh, just a, a variety of, of authors have written good articles for them. And I, I just... I wrote an article from one time, and I put a whole lot of work into it, and I'm, I'm pleased with the results, but even still, all that work I put into it, and I still feel that it's inferior to most of the articles at that site. Greg has really put together a good collection. It's, it's, it's very austere, very thought-provoking, just tremendous, tremendous stuff there. So if you get a chance, go to uh, www.thegamesjournal.com. So those are our websites of this yeah, month. good. If you, have a, if you have a website that you really think is good, send me a link. I'd like to check it out because I'm sure I haven't seen them all. And while I'm thinking about stuff that people send to us, uh, I've got a couple pictures of Dice Towers, um, uh, Dice Tower artwork. And so I'm going to put those <laughs> up on the web page as soon as I get around to coding them in. So look look for those pictures of Dice Tower artwork. Cool. I don't, I don't, I don't think Joe's seen them yet, but they're, no, they're pretty you, interesting. Tom secretly, you know, if you're going to, no one ever sends me email. They send them to Tom. Like, Joe gets lots of email. What's he talking about? <laughs> He hides the emails from me. Oh, what a week for games. We played a lot this week. We did, we did. We uh, we had that game. We went down to Seoul to a board game cafe, and we met with, uh, do you remember? I'm, I'm, horrible, I'm horrible with names. With Chris? Chris and his girl, or his wife, uh, Gretchen? No, not Gretchen. Why don't you talk about the games? Okay. Well, we played... Uh, we played three different games. The first game we played was Through the Desert. Um, I know that they had asked Tom to bring it 
and uh, we played Through the Desert twice, actually. And we it, Through the Desert is just a great game. Although every time I play it, I just want to eat the little the little camels. They look like candy to me. And uh, we played it twice. The first time, Tom destroyed us um, because I think he was taking advantage of the newbies. I should have put what, my through the desert. Yeah, I probably should have put my pieces closer to Tom's in proximity. Who won the second game? I did. Did you? Yeah, I snuck out the second game. By the way, we were playing Sean Lysak, his wife Carla, and our other friend uh, Garrett. Oh yeah, Garrett it was the Garrett strategy. That's our, our nickname for him. No, Garrett Grand strategy. The Grand strategy. The GGS. The GGS. We tease him. Garrett uh, goes to our church. He's a up and coming gamer. Right. He gets mad when we call him that because he's a number. He's a number two on a scale from one to ten. He's getting it. And the hierarchy. He's down there. <laughs> but uh, we played uh, through the desert twice. Yeah. And, it's a good uh, game. If you haven't played it, recommend it. And you said they're reprinting it, right, in a small box? It's already been reprinted. Fantasy Flight has put it out in a small box, and I couldn't believe they were going to fit the whole game in a small box. But when I saw it... Was it like a four-fold board or something? Yeah, but, I mean, they, they put it on the box, and, you know, I wish it, I had that version. It's what's a smaller... It, what's it running for? I might pick that up, I think. Like, I don't know. $25, maybe? $30? Does Game Fest sell it? Probably. I'll Go check, check it out, it. folks. Go Game Fest. Anyway, uh, what else we played? We played... Our um, big game of the night was La Cita. La, La Cita. Joe's never yes. played it before. No, it was, it was good. And uh, the Mega Metropolis City won. Yeah, Joe... No, no, no. it didn't. You lost oh, by one point. Oh, one point. But Joe thought he had the game in the bag, and he really... his. I have missed my last turn. I made some poor decisions. It's a game where you build cities, and you're and my cities just got destroyed. It wasn't a good game for me. <laughs> but Joe, this one huge city that just kept Octopus snuck out the cities around it, yeah. especially mine. In my last turn, I, I underestimated. I I miscounted my farms, and I, I got some people that starved to death, and I ended up losing five points because of it, along with those guys who starved to death, and I ended, and I lost the whole game by one point to a, a good player. Uh, she was really good. She she snuck, and I, I had no idea that she was doing so well. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned La Cita as a game I think should be reprinted, and I still think that. It's a great game, yeah. but it is a game. I it's mean, a game. It's, not, it's, not, it's not just a light game. It's higher in the arc- hierarchy of the games for the Euro world, I would <laughs> is say. That, is, that our, is that our buzzword for today, hierarchy? Yeah, the hierarchy, right. It's a gamer's game, but I liked it. And then we played Camelot, which Joe hated and I liked. Oh, man. <laughs> and and then we, 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 played, we played Camelot twice. Oh, we finished off the night with a bonk. Which is a great yeah. bluffing bit Total game. random luck game. Oh, but it's fun. We, but I won that game. Woohoo! I won it on the last turn because of... Thanks a, to my stupidity. Everyone else's, everyone else's stupidity. Ah. Yeah. But LeBanc, good game. Good I went game. from being last place to winning like $500,000 $500, in the last turn. But anyway. Then we played other various games throughout the week without each other. Joe's been playing ASL, what, every day? I've been playing ASL on Vassal, V-A-S-S-E-L. Uh, just about every night. It's funny because I'm on the other side of the world, so I'm signing on, and it's like people don't come online till about 11 o'clock my time, and I'm already starting to get ready to go to bed, and it's 8 in the morning for them or 9 in the morning for them, and they want to play a full game. And my wife's yelling at me from the bedroom at 2 in the morning, you got to go to work in the morning. So <laughs> ASL, man, you start playing and you forget what time it is. But I've been playing a lot of ASL, a lot of ASL starter kit. I've been proselytizing two different guys and so with the starter kit. And Tom will know because he's seen me playing quite a few times with one of the two guys. And um, what else did I play? I played Gem Blow again. Every time someone comes to my house, they want to play Gem Blow. Oh, we did play a game together yesterday called uh, Pizza Box Football. Oh, Pizza Box Football. And that's that's a great that's a great game. I it's want a, that game. It's a, it's a funny little. Funny I'm gonna game have that game that comes in a in a pizza box. You know, and what? it's about football. You should do a review. Have you are you have you run a uh, written review on that one yet? I'm going to write it soon. All right, because I don't want to steal all your thunder. But man, that is a great little game. It reminds me so much of. Uh, Madden football for the PlayStation, but it's realistic. Hey, it, it, they, whoever did it did a good job at making the game of football simplistic enough to, to be fun, but not so simplistic as you don't feel like you're doing right, anything. Right. That's, that's the problem I have with the PC games is when you play it, it's like the score, and the ending score is like 99 to 72 or something because every single time you throw the ball, you can get a touchdown. But this is not like that. It's really fun. Well, the one game Joe and I talked about recently, Lexio, is having a tournament this, uh, right. this coming Saturday. So if you have any tips on these ladder climbing games? Yeah, uh, Joe and I know pretty much or, nothing. You know, it is, it, yeah, we're just going to go in this. We're the token. We're the token white guys. We'll just go there and you know. We, you hope, know, we hope we do well. And every time we play a game, people take pictures of us. It's, it's hilarious. But uh, no, or if you're really rich and you want to fly in for the tournament, you know, if you can. <laughs> yeah, it's a three hundred dollar prize. Three hundred dollar prize. Eight hundred dollars for a ticket. So you you do the math. So we're going to play Lexio. And we bring it on to our, our category that's gotten a lot of feedback. Man, a lot of people have told us they like the player categories. Yeah. 
And so uh, I'm going to go first this time. Go ahead. Uh, we talked about, what, four categories? This time I have the ADD player. <laughs> and I mention this a lot because I, I, I play with teens. But my, I notice this mostly not with teens but with adults. They're people who can't concentrate in the game. They're distracted by everything. And I, I love the social interaction in the game. I like that you can pause the game and start talking about your favorite movie. Or, you know, someone has to go get snacks and you pause. But these are people who anything pauses the game for them. Anything. You know, a bird flies by the window and they're looking at it. And I've just explained the rule. And then later on they say, how does this work? And I explain the rule again. And I explain the rule again because even when they ask me the question, they suddenly stop paying attention. A kid cries in another room. There they go. They're gone. And it's not even their kid. And, but, you know, whatever happens, they're just they're distracted. And they're one of my least favorite people to play games with. And I think Joe agrees. Yep, definitely. I, I, oh, I just want to wring their necks. Now, I understand that sometimes. But I do that th- to you sometimes. This happens a lot. We play with. We play with mothers who have other responsibilities and such. Right, and that, right. that's, and that, that, that's, that's an exception. But the, the people who just can't pay attention to the game and get caught up in, huh, is it my turn now? You know, wake up and play the game. The ADD player. <laughs> All right, my, my player category this week is called the lawyer. Sounds now, good. The lawyer is uh, the person who, you know, it's your game. You bring it. You know the rules inside and out. And as soon as you start playing, he says, oh, can I see the rules? And the whole game He's looking over the rules, and he's looking down at the board, and he looks at the rules, and he looks down at the board. And three or four times in the game, he'll correct something. That doesn't even really matter. Or even if it does matter, just who cares? It's just a game. It's just a Euro game. Who cares? It's not breaking the game. But he's the guy that always has to correct every little thing. Oh, this, that guy irritates me. I know one of those guys really well. He's sitting right next to me. I think, I think it's important to play the game by the rules that are in the book. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, come on. Well, I don't care. I think I think that's a good category. And then you'll argue about, well, the rule says this, and you'll say, well, here it says this, and I say, but in this demo, we end up getting to like a, a lit- an argument about the gameplay. Meanwhile, the people are the rest of the players are just looking at us like, who cares? Let's let's play the game. Well, wow. well, this illustration of the game it does it this way. What takes precedence, Tom? Is it the written rule or the illustration? Seriously, I always go by the illustration. So do I, because okay, it we're... makes it makes more sense. Because I've definitely read rules that would say one thing, and then their game illustration does the opposite. Anyway. All right, all right. Next segment. I like that song. Uh, I hear it. All right. Anyway, <laughs> that introduces our half of one of our segments, which is kangaroos and turkeys. And today we're just doing the kangaroos because they're, they're cooler than turkeys. We'll do turkey next week. Now, a kangaroo, which is named after Joe because he's Joey. My son's name is Joey. Um, a kangaroo is a marsupial. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, either way, kangaroos are games that we thought were good. Uh, or we didn't think we're good, or, but either way, we think more highly of them now than we once did. Right. We start off with them lack, lackluster, or even like them, but now they're just a higher cap. You know, it's a much better game in our opinion. And and for me, that game would be Gang of Four by Days of Wonder, which for me was always the black spot on the Days of Wonder name because they make such great games, and I thought Gang of Four is kind of. Uh, they said it's the most popular game in China. Well, whoopee do. You know, it doesn't seem that very fun to me. And I guess there's a whole lot of other ladder climbing games that teach you and and uh, Frank Zoo and we just got the new one Lexio mm. and they never did anything for me but recently I've been playing them more and I'm seeing the strategies I'm seeing yeah. how it's fun it's still not as fun for me as a trick taking game kind of grows on you trick taking games are, are good but I, I I see the fascination people have with these games and I'll never ever get so involved with them that they'll take the place of any other game but. They're, they're, they're getting better. And Gang of Four, it's actually a pretty fun game. We're still learning the strategy, too, because I still don't know when to play yeah, my, um, I don't know when to play my five or if I'm supposed to hold it or what. Yeah, <laughs> please help us with those tips. Cause, a basic strategy. Because right. we're going to get destroyed at this tournament. <laughs> no, my uh, my kangaroo is Liar's Dice. Um, Ooh, good game. A, a, a few years ago, Tom brought this game out. He actually brought out Bluff. And uh, my wife, I guess it just really kicked with her. She liked it. And I thought it was okay, whatever. And then a few, about a year later, I saw it for... Very very cheap. I found the the Milton Bradley version for five dollars on uh, eBay, so I picked it up off eBay. And now it seems like every time someone comes over to my house for dinner or to visit, uh, it comes out because it's so easy to teach. And there's a lot of strategy to it. It's a lot of fun. I really really enjoy. It. I love the whole bluffing aspect of the game. Um, you can usually bluff your way through at least with the newbies. And until you start playing the same people over and over again, it reminds me of uh, poker there. But I, I I just really really enjoy it. Okay, good. Liar's Dice, good game. We both like that game. All right, I guess that's all our little segments. Now it's time for the big segment, the segment that people 
send us money to do. Uh, oh, I wish they did. Right, the right. segment that everyone likes. And our top ten games. Our top ten list of game expansions. Our top ten game expansions by Tom Bassel and Joe Stedman. Do, 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 do. Hey, we all like games. I like we love the, games. I like the scumbag thing better. Yeah, well... What's your name, scumbag? I... I, I I like a lot of games, <laughs> but I like when you add options to the games. All oh, right. There's people who complain about expansions and say that they're just there to suck your money out, and yeah, maybe that's what the companies do, but I like the options that expansions add. There are some expansions that don't add much to the game, but there's a lot of expansions that really make the game better. In fact, I'd say most of them. And so what we've done here is we talk, we're talking about our top ten game expansions. Right. And... Surprisingly enough, we only have one that's the same. And it's a very and it's both of our number ten. Number ten. Uh, Attack, the expansion. Attack is a really simple, fun war game, in my opinion. Very, it's very. Good. You very, don't need the expansion. No, you don't. But the the, the, the expansion adds a lot. It, it makes it a deeper game. game. Changes it totally. It adds a political arena to the game. It adds the naval ships to the game. It adds a tw- the the map is now twice as big. <laughs> it's huge. The map. <laughs> the map is really. It's a it's a night. It's a Speaking of which, if you ever get to go to Origins or any of the other events that Eagle Games is at, oh yeah, and you see their giant attack map, it's just phenomenal. Like Fifteen by twenty. They have these big sticks and they're pushing around these little miniature tanks on it. It's really cool. But yeah, attack the attack expansion. Uh, like you said, attacks a very light war game. I think it's one step above Axis and Allies, in my opinion. At least the basic Axis. No, no, and the Allies basic game. the basic attack is probably a step well, lower below, than. Right, right, and okay. Allies. Let me clarify that. My yeah, the attack with the expansion to me is a step above the basic Axis and Allies, and on the on the hierarchy, on the hierarchy of war games. Yeah, but you know, with that, I, I will accept because I think in, in level of complexity, it, it's better. It. I, I think if I was introducing people to, to games like that, I would always play the basic game with them first because right. it is simpler. And I've done that with soldiers before because a lot of soldiers like the, the Access and Allies. And so it, the, the wean them off of Access and Allies, I, the first game I usually try to get to them to play is uh, Attack. With And I usually will show them the basic game, and then I'll say, but check this out. And I'll pull out the expansion, and I said, do you guys want to try this? And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I almost always use the expansion when I play. Yeah, it adds a lot of political stuff. It adds the different political parties. You could be communist or democratic. Mm-hmm. It adds oil which is a big deal yeah it adds like he just said a huge another section of the game board it adds actually plastic ships instead of right. the cards because the, before the, the the naval warfare is very abstracted before right and and now it's a little bit better so i i really i really enjoyed this expansion amen all right this episode of the dice tower is sponsored by your move games whose most recent battleground faction the high elves is currently in stores number nine is it me or you? Who do you want to go first this week? You're first. All right. Number nine for me is uh, the Time's Up expansion number one. Now, yes, it's a party game, and yes, I can't believe I'm saying it, but it's it's uh, Time's Up is probably my, my favorite party game right now. It's been for a few years, and we've played it so many times that we ran out of people. And the expansion set adds uh, like 500 new people to the game. Uh, it adds a bunch of blank cards that you can add your own. One of my favorite cards is the card that says Tom Vassell. No, no, no. The blank cards come in a different set. Oh, well, they, they do? Well, okay, maybe I thought it was the same set. But th- I really, really enjoy the uh, the new cards. It adds, it gives the game more replayability. So. Yeah, I bought I bought the set of blank cards, and I, and I put in a whole bunch of Bible characters. And then people who played the game would complain and say, we don't know these Bible characters. But yet they would... When other people didn't know, pop culture people, they would get, oh, you should know this stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. It's interesting. But the expansion adds a lot more interesting people right. to it. Historical people. It, and even fantasy people. And it, it adds a... It I adds think Frodo a, was in it, yeah. It adds a, a wider gambit. And I, I, I agree. The expansion set number one for yeah, Canada is really too. good. My number nine expansion is Duel of Ages Master's Addendum. Now, Duel of Ages has eight expansions. This is number eight. I think it's one of the best expansions for Duel of Ages because it comes with a, a large rule book, which is actually over 20 pages for me, which is an odd thing. But I love Duel of Ages. Great game. But the, the rule book is wonderful. It has color layouts all throughout it, questions and answers. It goes through everything in great detail. But not only that, they added all these characters to the game. Uh, and three of them were characters that I've designed, and so I was really pleased by that they, they changed them in the design process but <laughs> be, besides that it just added piles of characters it, it combined all the rules into one book 
added a few more weapons. It was a good fitting end for the Duel of Ages series. Isn't it one of the characters your wife? Yeah. yeah. My wife's uh, maiden name is Swanson, so Laura Swanson, but they changed it to Lyra Swan. But that's good enough. It, it, my wife thinks it's cool. She's in a game. She'll never play Duel of Ages, but she's in it. Hmm. So number nine for me was Duel of Ages Master's Addendum. All right, number eight. My number eight is the uh, the Russian campaign, Southern Expansion Kit. Now, uh, the Russian campaign is one of the classic war games. It's actually, uh, I did uh, uh, last year I compiled all of the Consum World's uh, top five games. It took me forever to do. But the Russian campaign's in the top ten. It's like the number two, I think. Uh, and the, the Southern Expansion set uh, expands the game quite a bit, more than you might think. It's definitely worth picking up. It's fairly cheap. And uh, L2... L2 Games has redone the Russian campaign. I highly suggest it. And get the Southern Campaign, the Southern Expansion Kit. It brings new life into the game that you're probably very familiar with. For me, my number eight is Age of Steam, uh, map number three, which has Korea on one side and Scandinavia on the other side. Now, each map for Age of Steam is basically a whole new game. It has a few new rules and a map, new map layout. And if you've ever played Age of Steam, which you should, it's unbelievable how each map totally changes everything around and the Korean map I li- the Scandinavian map I liked it was, it's really really hard but I liked it but I love the Korean map because in, in this map uh, each city's color was variable during it you know they would only accept cubes that were already in the city and so it made for a very interesting game and I thought it was a really good expansion for Age of Steam it made the whole game completely different and I know I'm not alone in this Shin Yu my Korean friend it's also his favorite map hmm. and not because it's Korea but because it's just a really cool map sure no. Number seven. Now, number seven for me is uh, the Formula Day circuits 23 to 26. Now, uh, we and Tom were talking about this earlier, but the, it's a USA track pack, and this is, this is, is actually because I'm an American. Uh, I like this one. Now, uh, I just like this one. It's got the big, huge track in it. If you've ever set it up, it's, it's the biggest one. Um, all the Formula Day tracks are, are very interesting. I, I, I've always got a little a tender spot. How for many these. are now? 30? I don't know. 35? There's a lot of them. There's quite a following for the game. Uh, but every time I think of the track packs, I get a little upset when I think of that Korean board gaming conference. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> Joe won't give that up. He lost the. He lost the. Uh, I, I didn't lose. I got cheated. I got cheated out of it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. That, no, I'm not, I agree. All right, anyway. So I, I put the track pack there just kind of as a nod to uh, the Formula Day support and expansions because it's hard to just name one map that's the best. But I just like the fact that you can. There's so many different maps, you can never run out of options for that game. Well, it also solves, like, one of the mysteries of life, because when you buy the original Carabande, you oh, get yeah. the map, and you, like, Carabande. it's, it's half... You mean... Did I say Carabande? Yeah. I'm sorry, Formula Day. When you buy a Formula Day, you get a map, and it's a track, but part of it goes off the board, and it looks like it makes a bigger track. And you, can't and you wonder, why. Well, where does that go? All right, right. Well, the pack that Joe mentioned has the other half. Right, so you can set up <laughs> one one time around a track takes like an hour. Yeah, and you know what? It's actually a pretty good game around that that huge track. So I guess I guess if I would buy one of the maps, that would probably be it. Mm. So I guess Joe's right. Woohoo! My number seven expansion is Carabande expansion. Carabande slash pitch car is where you flick little wooden disc cars around a track. It's the real way to race, not Formula Day style. Use your fingers and flick them around. It's a lot of fun. But Carabande would be probably half as fun without the expansion. Why? Because expansion adds a jump. And the jump is just really cool. To jump the disc beats out everything. Now, no, I'm specifically talking about the Carabande, Carabande expansion and not the pitch car because the pitch car expansion did not come with a jump. And I'm still a little perturbed at the pitch car company for not making their, their tracks compatible with the Carabande ones. They're different cuts. We managed to fit them together jury rigging it but <laughs> anyway Carabon is so much better than Carabon that. expansion is really expensive so I don't know if you'll have a chance to find it but if so you ever find it it's a good game was it just me or is the Carabon day just so much better than the new version what's the new one called again I don't know if it's so much better but it, it, it seems better quality it does seem a little bit better quality now so that's my number seven the Carabon day expansion all right number six Number six for me is uh, A Clash of Kings. It's an uh, expansion for Game of Thrones. It adds a bunch of new features to the game. Um, it allows you to play with what goes from uh, up to six player, right? Or seven? No, it goes up to six now. Yeah, it goes up to six. Uh, it's just, I really, really enjoy it. It's, I really like the Game of Thrones game because it's, a light, it's like an easy version of diplomacy. There's a lot of the aspects of diplomacy you have in this game. Uh, it adds catapults, um, a whole new set of cards that are more powerful. Um, 
you replace the old cards with the new cards. It's just a very interesting uh, pickup for the game. It, it, like once again, I, expansion. This this whole this whole top ten list was kind of hard for me because I'm not much into as expansions as Tom is, and so some of these, you know. Well, that was a good expansion. Yeah. Because that expansion added lots of different features that you could add some of them or so, and not add some. Fantasy Flight does a good job with their expansions when they do stuff like that because you can choose some of the options or not all of them. But I heard that all Fantasy Flight games are poorly rule tested. Yeah, well, whoever said that's stupid. <laughs> That's my that's my go, quick. Go, say, that's, that's my that's my that's my. Let me, get, let me hear your shut. That's my thirty second rant. If if you're always criticizing people's games, shut up and start your own game company. Okay? Yeah, because that takes me off. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Tom. I think their games are good. Anyway, my number six expansion is Bang Dodge City. Bang's a great game. Everyone knows that. And if you don't think so, you're wrong. It's a good card game. But Dodge City added a whole bunch of cool new features and. You know, after playing Bang for a while, it's like, uh, it's starting to get to be the same, but Dodge City added another Renegade. Two Renegades in the same game for Bang is really cool. You can play eight players now with two Renegades, and both Renegades are on different teams, and that just, I mean, they're, they're both, they, only one Renegade can stand, and it makes the game a lot cooler. Yeah, Bang's fun. So, that's my number six expansion. All right, number five for me is the Kremlin Revolution. This is the for the old Avalon Hill game Kremlin. They made an uh, expansion called Revolution, where it actually replaces the fictional characters with the historical characters, and it, it changes out the the cards, the optional cards, gives you all new optional cards with different situations. But to me, it just made the game much more fun with the real people. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm a history nut, but it was just more fun to. To be, you know, have they have Stalin up there or, or whoever, you know, or these these real people and the Khrushchev and things like that. Uh, I thought it was cool. Yeah, for me, the number five game was Lord of the Rings: Friends and Foes. It takes the Lord of the Rings cooperative game and makes it even more deadly. It adds a whole bunch of enemies, and some people complain because it's pretty easy to defeat the enemies. I don't know. For me, it made the game so much harder. <laughs> with with Lord of the Rings, I can beat it pretty easily. With Lord of the Rings: Friends and Foes. Uh, it's a tough, tough game now. Although I don't play Lord of the Rings as much anymore now that Shadows of Camelot's around. Uh, the trader's just cool. Oh, speaking of that, we didn't mention that. We played Shadows of Camelot, Joe and I, with some teenage boys. Oh, man. And the That's one the who was the traitor was so good at being the traitor, we never suspected him. But we ended up, we did win, though, by, we, by one point. After we already declared him the winner because we miscounted the points. Yeah, we miscounted the swords at the end. We didn't that really, was a good game. Yeah, that it, like, went down to the very end. It was the first time I've ever seen the uh, the good guys win. No, the Grail. It was the first time I've personally seen the Grail get. Yeah, we 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 did jump on that, but we did play one real wrong too. That's normal. Yeah. All right, number four. Right, we number four. We are at number four. Number four to me is uh, Ambush Purple Heart. Now, there's been three different expansions for the old victory game Ambush. Purple Heart is the is the best in my opinion. It adds new maps. It adds a bunch of new scenarios. Um, I really, all the if, if you can get them on eBay, just get the whole. When I bought mine, I just bought Ambush with the expansions, like in a lot. And uh, but Purple Heart's probably the best. I think most people would agree because it adds six new scenarios, new weapons, vehicles, everything. New maps is the big thing. Um, and people say, what's the point of a solitaire squad level game when you can just play a computer game? Apples and oranges, man. In my opinion. Okay. Well, I don't know. For me. Uh, my number four is Carcassonne Traders and Builders. Everyone knows that Carcassonne has 6,453 billion expansions. <laughs> Too many. Maybe not. There's like six. But the Traders and Builders is my favorite. It has the most features to the game. And uh, I, don't, I don't know why I like it the best. But I, I guess I like the Builder. He has more strategy options. I have not yet played the Princess and the Dragon. That one looks like it could be my favorite expansion. But for now, it's Traders and Builders for Carcassonne. And that's my number four. All right. Number three. My number three is uh, West Front by Columbia Games. This is a it's not it's a standalone game, so I guess it doesn't really fit the pure definition of an expansion. But it's uh, the second in a series of games, and uh, you know the first being Euro. I mean East Front, and West Front is one of the prerequisites if you want to do Euro Front, which is one of the games I talked about earlier. But West Front is obviously the Western Front with the uh, the Wallies and the uh, the Germans. I really really like the West Front. Uh, I will admit that West Front's probably not as fun as East Front, but it's a great expansion. It's a great second uh, set. And uh, in the family of games. Okay, it does sound a little bit more interesting. Uh, mine is uh, Seafarers of Catan, which is the expansion for Settlers of Catan. I like the Cities and Knights expansion a lot, and there's, but the Seafarers is just the way an expansion should be: simple, 
clean, easy to add, with lots of options, uh, lots of scenarios to add it in the book. Uh, the only bad thing about Seafarers is it was probably overpriced. You don't get as much, and it costs as much as the basic game. But other than that, Seafarers is a good expansion. If you like Settlers and you don't own Seafarers, go out and buy it right now uh, from GameFest.com. <laughs> number two. My number two is uh, Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit number two, which is, once again, uh, a standalone game, but it's uh, in a family. And uh, Starter Kit, Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit, to me, is the one. Can you combine them? Yeah, you can combine them. So it, it, oh, adds, okay. it adds together. It adds it adds more bits, more counters, more rules. And the, the whole starter kit thing is, uh, is designed to introduce people to advanced squad leader gradually rather than just having them jump into this uh, very rules-intensive game. But it, it gradually builds it up. And starter kit 2 introduces indirect fire and uh, guns and things like this. And uh, I know they're planning for starter kit 3 to come out, which is going to introduce vehicles and tanks, I think. If I remember reading it, but I was just happy that Starter Kit 2 came out. I have it, and uh, they cleaned up the this first rule book, and they they did something really neat. Is they reprinted the original rule book for Starter Kit, but they just added the new rules in a different font. I think, and that's that's the way you should do or it. Or a different color. That so is that the way you should do it. It's one rule book rather than having two separate rule books to go back and forth to. And I like that fact. Yeah, Joe and I were talking about the DOD because I got Mayor Nostrum expansion, and I was looking at the rule book, and they italicized the new rules, but they added the old rules in, so it's one complete rule book. That, my friends, is the way to do it. Yeah, definitely. For me, my number two is More Cosmic Encounter by Mayfair. Now, we're still waiting and hoping that someday a company will pick up Cosmic Encounter and reprint it. Um, but the while we're waiting, we have Mayfair's Cosmic Encounter to go by, and I really love More Cosmic Encounter because it added 6,000 trillion options in one box. Piles of Aliens, Lucre, Moons, it's all in that one box. Half these options I never play with, but it was just all there, and I really, really enjoy it. More Cosmic Encounter, add it to one of my favorite games. So that's my number two expansion. And now for our number one expansions. Well, I guess you could say they're expansions. Well, go ahead. Oh, well, my, my number one expansion is Beyond Valor. Now, Beyond Valor is ASL module number one. I'm on, Like I said, I'm on an ASL kick. But uh, modular one is the beginning of the addiction, and it's a prerequisite for... Almost all the future ASLs. The first thing that you have to buy after you get the rule book, um, and they have two different versions. They have the original, then they have a second edition, which is really cool because it's got uh, it's got a bunch of different boards in it. Um, it's got the red barricades map. It's out of print though, but uh, Multiman Publishing's got it on its uh, what's it called when you um, the sign up list? You know, like P-500? a pre registration. No, they don't do P500. That's GMT. But they have a pre-registration uh, where you can order it. Uh, they're republishing it, hopefully soon. I'd like to pick it up. Even though I've got Red Barricades, I got it off eBay. I mean, not Red Barricades. Even though I've got Beyond Valor already, I got it off of uh, the, the Internet. Uh, I'd like to pick up this new. It's got a um, bunch of stuff in it. It's great. And it's, a, it's the beginning of the addiction, so that's kind of a nod to ASL, I guess, just to all the different expansions that you can get. As you can tell, nowadays Joe's a real ASL fan. <laughs> well, I'll probably get off this in not too long. But. My number one game expansion is Duel of Ages Intensity. It's expansion number two. Duel of Ages is a great game. You add a number two, and it becomes a superb, masterful, wonderful, marvelous, awesome, terrific, tremendous game. It adds team bases, more characters, more cards, more everything. And I like Master's Addendum. The eighth expansion, but expansion eight is good. Recommend it. Expansion two, necessary. You must buy it. So for me, the best expansion is for my favorite game, Duel of Ages Intensity number two. We're about to to close the show down with our part two report from Walt O'Hara, who uh, is going to finish up his World Board Gaming Championship uh, report. But uh, a couple things. Next week we have a report from Gary Christensen. Who's yep. going to be talking? The Mighty Man, the the Human Mountain. We've also been using um, Gmail, uh, G, G, Google um, call, Google Talk. Google Talk, right? We both have it. I'm Tom Vassell at gmail.com, and he's I think Joe, Joe Stedman at, at gmail.com. And if you want to talk to us, we like to record conversations and stick them on the show every once in a while, or just talk to you. Yeah, we like to just talk. Just talk, of, you know. Get to know you. So at if us. you have either one of those, and you you, you can sign that up. Or Sign if, up for that. And, if you and don't have it, contact me. Email. I'll email. I got like a hundred invites, and so yeah, we're loaded. So if you're not if you're not on Gmail yet, then get on the ball. I mean, come on. Yeah, but either way, it's a good way for us to talk to people, and you know, the, sometimes it's hard to catch us at the right time, but it is possible, and so that that's a way for you to get on the show, and your voice will be heard by millions. Right. Or you can just talk to us. 
And so I guess that that's it for me today. Uh, we're gonna. Like to, we've been doing a lot of good. Uh, how much time do we have? Any time at all? Uh, maybe a minute. I was just to say that I really appreciate all the stuff they've been doing at Board Game Geek lately. They've been doing a lot of changes there. It's really nice. So that's a, a nod to Aldi. Yeah, I like the new profile page. They actually let you put your top ten in. Have you done that yeah, yet? Yeah, I've already added my top ten. So have I. I'm waiting to let see. You can search other people's top tens to see how much they correlate. Right, right. right. So as soon as I added them, I'm, I'll look it up. Board game keeps changing every day. I think it's going to take over the world one day. Well, all right. <laughs> well, either way, uh, thanks for listening to episode 15 of the Dice Tower. We hope you come back next week. I'm Tom Basil. I'm Joe Stedman. And this is Walt O'Hara. Now, I just sat in on an open game of Empire of the Sun to see how it's played, because they were already well advanced into the game when I dropped by. I really like the way the game streamlines the big events of the Pacific War into a manageable time period. It's an interesting approach to grand strategy gaming, combining hexes and cards really nicely. This is the same designer, Mark Herman, who designed the Pacific War monster game by Victory Games, which took days and days to play, if I'm remembering things right. He is. So it's kind of an ironic yin to the yang of Empire of the Sun, which plays really quickly if you wanted to. The Combat Soldiers game from LBJ is, or LBG, I keep saying that, is a real hoot to play. Lost the time. Very upfront in its approach. With, uh, with the same double purpose card style, meaning it's uh, German on top and American on the bottom, uh, that was used in Gorilla, which was done by the same uh, designer, you know, Schlaffer. Now, I have uh, mixed impressions of Columbia's latest glut of grand tactical block games. Block games have their limitations in situations where fog of war really isn't required for the game to work. I didn't much care for fog of war in their last Gettysburg game, for instance. However, In Crusader Rex, it really, really does work well with the block mechanic. Crusader is an uphill uphill battle for the Western player and quite a challenge for the Arab player as well. Um, I had a few hairy moments, believe me. Uh, Well, that's the highlights of my WBC shopping list. I saw some great games set up and played and sat in on a few, like the new Arkham Horror from Fantasy Flight Games. Seven Ages from the Australian Design Group was also popular. Kind of reminds me of History of the World, but very playable. And uh, I, I, I saw the new Conquest of the Empire. I didn't see it played, um, but I uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> lusted we after it, it in, in my own quiet way. I didn't we end up getting it in the contest or anything, but oh well. Sour grape. Uh, oh. Joe, you might be interested in the new two new releases from the Worthington Games guys. They oh, the have, ones that were given away. Two hidden tile games out. One on the American Revolution and one on the War of 1812. Is that a coincidence? I will get to getting both of them. Hmm. They are a little bit more generic um, uh, than, say, uh, Victoria Cross, um, but you can model many more battles with both games, and they're interacting with each other, which is nice. So uh, there were other highlights at WBC. I got to meet some people I've never seen in the flesh before, like Gary the Man Mountain Christensen from Cavs and Chester, your buddy Hendrix. I also got a chance to interact with some great people that I already know. I like chatting with Dave Fox and Ben Hall about Under the Lily Banners and rambling on with Chester about developing a new game based on Starship Troopers. The last official thing I did was present an um, International Gamers Award, which we call the Iggy's, to Ray Farrell for Sword of Rome without blowing it too badly. Considering I've been up playing Euros until 3.30 a.m. the night before, I wonder how I even woke up by 8 when I had to make my presentation. Oh, and I actually gave being in a tournament a try on Sunday morning just to say I did. I, I played in the openers of a choir, which is one of my favorite uh, business simulation type games, and I got seriously trounced, but now I can say I've done it. Uh, it was fun. I mean, they, the guys that I played with are far more serious than I am. Um, they were in it for the win, and uh, they didn't want to talk or, or have any idle chatter at the table. And I can see how that might be putting some people off, but, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, can, I can take that. I can get into the approach of, you know, trying to play a game the best I possibly can and to seriously, seriously sit there and try and be competitive and think about something. It was different for me. I, I play sillier games usually. Anyway, I had a good time. So that's about all I have on WBC, and I know you think I ramble on, Tom, and you're probably already talking over me right now. Oh, now I am. Yeah, okay. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I'll sign off here with, <laughs> with uh, some final greetings to both of you and the rest of the 96 listeners. So, uh, 99. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening to Dice Tower, folks. That was good, Walt. Thanks, man. Yeah, he's the best. 
And thus Walt became basically our first regular contributor. Now we have piles of those regular contributors, and I'm very glad for them. If you see here, we talked and said, once again, played it for someone to reprint Cosmic Encounter, and lo and behold, that seems to get closer and closer every day. I'm constantly reading about some of the things. Uh, Kevin Wilson is a huge Cosmic Encounter fanatic, and he's in charge of uh, the development for Cosmic Encounter at Fantasy Flight Games. So I'm really pleased that they picked it up. I'm looking forward to seeing that, and I'm looking forward to seeing the expansions. Expansions are a top ten list that I could probably do every two or three years and have several that change because there's just some great expansions that are being uh, released these days. In fact, if you listen to a few shows ago and we did our top ten games of 2007, you'll hear several of the uh, top expansions of that year are probably on my top ten expansions of all time. An interesting thing I was thinking about as I listened to this episode again was how we talked about the year here in which so many great games came out and where Ticket to Ride and Memoir 44, all that stuff came out in 2004. And really, really, truly, and honestly, that was that may go down as one of the best years in gaming ever because you listen to the games that came out in the year and they were games that we're still talking about that we're still playing with enthusiasm today. While a lot of games that come out in other years, while they may be the hot thing of the month for a while, they seem to die out. Like, how often do you hear about Takal anymore? Now, Takal is a great game. A lot of people love it and such, but it's, it's, it's died out. While Ticket to Ride, Memoir, um, Power Grid, those, those three games are just phenomenal games that are still highly rated and played. Well, I'll stop rambling and let you get on. Uh, But if you have some chance, maybe you want to go over to funagaingames.com and check out some of my new audio reviews. I should be adding two or three of those this week. And you can always check out our archives of other shows at the Dice Tower. Until then, this is Dom Vassell. Thanks for joining us today. Stop by next week for episode 118, in which we talk about our kids' top ten games. We'd like to thank Your Move Games for their sponsorship. Check out www.yourmovegames.com to find out why Battleground Fantasy Warfare made Tom's top ten games of all time. Or join in the discussion on their forums. Until next week, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Dice Tower.